So are you guys ready for the word? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's pray before we um, allow the Lord to feed us spiritually. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you just thanking you for all that you've done up until this point. You've been so good and so kind to allow us to bask in your presence and to worship you and to sing songs unto you. Now, Lord, I pray that you will continue to be right here, that you will be open up at heart right now. Someone who does not know you, Father, I pray that the word will just begin to, to penetrate their hearts and that they will receive you, receive the Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, for those who are saved, I pray that the word will teach them something new, as you've already taught me, Lord. And I thank you, I thank you, and I love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, open up your Bibles to Ezra, E-Z-R-A. That is in the Old Testament. Ezra, chapter 7. And I'll read verse 10. The Samuels, the Kings... The Chronicles and Ezra. Oh, Esther is in there? No, somewhere. <laughs> yes, you're right. If you've seen Nehemiah, you've gone too far. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. If you found it, say amen. 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 And it reads, For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Again, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. The title of today's sermon is, The Word of God is our help. The Word of God is our help. A few weeks ago, I was on a mission. Um, are you familiar with the movie called The Help? Mm -hmm. How many of you all have seen the movie already? All right, great movie, right? Um, well, before I went to see the movie, I wanted to read the book. See, I, I saw the trailers and I said, oh man, this is going to be a, a good book, you know, I mean a good movie. It's about the South and I'm from the South, I'm from Tennessee, and so I can relate to some of these stories. So I was really excited about seeing the movie based on all the reviews and all that I had seen. Uh, but I wanted to read the book because, you know, sometimes a movie doesn't do a book justice. So I said, you know what, I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to read this book before I see this movie. And so I had set out on a mission. And I started to read this book and found myself just all caught up in the book. I mean, every chance I could get, I was reading this book called The Help. I was on the bus in my morning time, I was reading this book. In the evening time on my way home, I was reading this book. I'm telling you, if I had a moment just to breathe, I was reading this book. I was determined to read it and get finished. Even Caleb noticed how much I was reading this book. I mean, one time he was looking for me in the house, and um, I was in the bedroom. He said, Mommy, Mommy, where are you? And he found me in the bedroom, and he said, What are you doing? He said, I'm hungry. And he said, Oh, man, are you reading that book again called The Help? I was like, Son, go on out the room, and I'm shooing him. I was like, You know what? I'm going to get dinner in just a minute. Go on and eat some crackers or something. It'll be all right. Let me just finish this chapter. You see, I was entangled in this story because it was, it was good. You know, there are times in the book that I would laugh and times that I would cry. And, you know, when I finished the book, I was like, wow, look how far we've come. And, oh, look how far we've got to go. And, I mean, I was reading it. It was just, it was amazing. Even when people would see me on the bus or um, at the ferry as I was going to and fro work, they would see the book and people would comment. They're like, oh, you're reading that book. Oh, yeah, it's a good book. Uh, there's a lady on the bus with me, and I call her my bus buddy because we happen to get off at the same time at our stop. She was reading the book at exactly the same time. So when we would get off, we would chat about different parts in the book, and we'd laugh and just reminisce. i tell you, the book, it, it's like a phenomenon. It was, it was catching on. Well, I'm happy to report that I finished the book. I finished all 522 pages. I mean, I was excited. So I got a chance to re see the movie just the last week and loved it, cried and everything. Oh, awesome. I had accomplished a goal. 
But after I read that book, the Holy Spirit spoke Whoa. to me and said, Mikhail, now you were really excited and got yourself caught up and you're lost in this book called The Help and you had this zeal and this commitment. I mean, at any chance you could get, you read that book. But Mikhail, there's another book. There's another book that is just more popular than the, the book called The Help. There's another book, Mikhail, that is outsells many, plenty of other books. There's another book that's out there that sells millions and millions of copies every year. There's another book out there, Mikhail, that sells even more copies than the, the Harry Potter. And you all know how popular Harry Potter books are. But yet there is another book, Mikhail, that if you allowed yourself to get swept up and caught up in that particular book, Mikhail, and if you allowed yourself to read it from cover to cover, I tell you, Mikhail, you would find yourself weeping at times if you read that book. You would find yourself laughing at times if you read that book, Mikhail. If you want to know how far you've come and how far you've yet to go, Mikhail, why don't you pick up that particular book? If you have an idea of what I'm talking about, the book that I'm talking about, it is the word of God. It is the Bible itself. I tell you, the, the problem is, is that we find time for any and everything but the word of God. It is amazing. And I was like, oh, Lord, oh, hey, that's, that's me, Holy Spirit. All right. <laughs> All righty, Mikhail, check yourself. Yes, that's exactly what happened. And it, it caused me to, to realize that Bible study and reading God's word is important to the development of Christians. It is alarming how many Bibles are sold. I looked, did a little research and found that um, over 91% of American homes have at least one Bible in the home. Over 91% have at least one Bible. Most of us on average have four Bibles in our home. Now, now, if we've got all these Bibles being sold and we've got multiple Bibles in the home, what are we doing with the Bibles? What are we doing? Are we using them as coasters? Are we using them as, as bookends? I mean, do we have the, the, the Bible that's been handed down from generation to generation and it, it sits on the coffee table in the living room or in the dining room all nice and pretty turned to your favorite passage of scripture that you never read? What are we doing with the word of God? Because with all these Bibles out there, and if we were truly reading the word of God, I mean, lives would be changed. But there is someone that we can learn from today, and that is Ezra himself. You see, Ezra was not just some ordinary man. Ezra was a priest and a scribe and a teacher. A scribe gently or particularly takes care of the word. It says that he, he meditated on the word, he studied the word, he devoted himself to the word. You see, Ezra had favor with God. Go up to um, verse 6 of that same chapter, chapter 7, verse 6. It says, this Ezra came from Babylon. He was a teacher well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord, his God, was on him. You see, even the king had to obey and acknowledge the power and, and the favor of God with Ezra. Um, you, you see, Ezra was someone, not just any ordinary person, but he understood the, the value and the importance of the law. If we want to find favor with God, we too need to model ourselves like Ezra. We need to be devoted to studying the word. We need to be devoted to applying the word and we need to be devoted to teaching the word. Now, when you look back at the text, there's a key word there, which is devoted. Now, there are two aspects. When you break down the definition of devoted, there are two particular aspects to this definition. The first one is, is that it sets in your heart. 
See, when you read the King James Version of this same passage, it says that he prepared his heart to seek the law. You see, Ezra knew that the law of Moses and that these valuable scriptures was no plaything. You know, he, he took it very seriously. He was intentional and he prepared his heart. He was devoted to reading the word of God. Let's look at Psalm 119. You all are familiar with Psalm 119. Let's look at what it says about the relationship with the heart and the word of God. Psalm 119, starting with verse 1, it says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are, the, are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are, too, that are, to, be, that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. Verse 8 says, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his, his way pure? By living according to the word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And then verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart, amen, that I might not sin against you. You see, if you're going to be devoted, it's got to be within your heart that allows you to spend this time with the word of God. See, the problem is, is that we try to use too much of our head when it comes to understanding the word of God. But you've got to use your heart. See, if you used your heart and you allowed your heart to, to, to provide clarity, then you would really understand Romans 10, 9 and 10 when it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, too many times, even when we try to understand Romans 10, 9, 10, we allow the head. I, I can't quite grasp that. You know, who is this God that he would love me enough to send his son to die for me? And all that I have to do is confess and acknowledge, oh, that, I, I, don't, I don't comprehend that. that. That doesn't sound right. I mean, Mikhail, uh, the, the, the fact that I am not worthy, the fact that I am unholy and unrighteous, and there's nothing that I did to deserve your love, but yet you love me in spite of everything that I am. And you sent your son to die for me. I cannot understand it. Mikhail, it's not for you to understand it, but you just receive it with your heart. Hallelujah. And let God work out the rest. But the problem is, is that we allow our minds to get caught up and we don't become devoted based on our mind. But the word tells us that we've got to be devoted and committed to this based on our heart. One question I want to ask you today is, when you read your Bible, is it out of duty or devotion? When you study God's word, is it out of duty or out of devotion? You see, Martha and Mary, you, you know the, the two sisters. One of my, one of my favorite stories, when, when Jesus came to Martha's house, it was Martha who was in the kitchen doing her duty as the older sister. Out of obligation, she was preparing the meal, but it was Mary, hallelujah, who showed a devotion from her heart that says, you know what? The duties and the obligations can wait, but because of my devotion and my love for Jesus, I'm going to sit at his feet. This is a chance of a lifetime, and I'm going to seize the opportunity to sit at his feet. I tell you, sometimes when we give these 15 minute and 20 minute devotional times, it's only out of duty. Right. It's only out of duty. But if you allow it to be a true devotion and you really sit with the Father, hallelujah. Sometimes we treat our devotion as if we're going up to the Mike, Mike, uh, McDonald's drive through window. 
you know, I only got, I only got a short length of time, so I'm going to pull up here. I need you to get my coffee. I need to get my word and whatever, and I'm gone. But sometimes out of, out of um, devotion, you need to go inside, yes, sit down a little while, pull up, a, a get, get the word out, drink your coffee while you're sitting there, not while you're driving. You cannot multitask when you're trying to observe and absorb the word of God. God wants you to be single-minded when you're, when you're reading his word. Don't do it out of a duty, like you checking a box because that's what our covenant says that I must read my word daily, God wants more. When you do it out of devotion, then he can truly sit there and talk with you and tell you about how much he loves you, tell you about what his plan and his purpose is for your life. If you're willing to sit there and be devoted to him. You know, when Oren leaves and goes to work in the morning, I don't want him to tell me that he loves me out of some duty or routine. You know, just because that's the thing that a spouse is supposed to do. You get up, you get ready for work, you tell your, work, your wife you love her, you kiss her, and then boom, I'm gone. I, I don't want that. I want him to say, I love you because it comes from the heart. And I'm happy to report that he says he loves me from his heart. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. But I, but I, I tell you, it's only because he loves God himself. Amen. But God wants you to tell him that you love him, not out of duty, not out of obligation. God wants you to spend time in his word and show him that you love him, not because you got 15 minutes and that's all you can spare. But God wants you to sit there and allow the word to marinate in your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not only do we need to just read the word, but we actually need to study the word. You see, there's a difference between reading the word and studying the word. If you go back to the text, it says that Ezra had devoted himself to the study. See, Ezra did more than just read the word. He studied the word. There's two, I mentioned that there's, there's two aspects to this definition of devotion or devoted. The second aspect is that it requires intense labor and study time. It, it requires intense labor and study time. See, when you read the word, you've got to, you, you need to actually um, begin to figure out what is it saying and, and how do I understand it and, and, and spend some time in the word. You can't just do some drive-bys or, or these 15-minute prayer times or a study time. That's not going to work. You see, most of us have some type of degree or an education. Some of us have diplomas. Some of us have bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, whatever it is. Some of us, uh, you know, you, and you figure, you know what? I've gone to school. I, I've done all the, the learning that I'm going to do. But I'm here to tell you, if you are a true Christian, school is still in session. School is still in session. You don't get to have a spring break or a, a summer break or a winter break. And Lord knows I never heard of a winter break until I came to California. But you don't even get to have those kind of breaks when it comes to being a student of the word. The word says that we must take up our cross daily and follow him. So, I, you know, I can't pick and choose when I'm going to follow God's word if I'm a student. He says to pick it up daily and follow him. You've got to be willing to study and stay in the word. But the problem is, is that we treat the word like it's some, you know, like, like college. See, what happens in college is that you have some options. You can take your general education courses. Those are courses that are required for everybody. The basics, you know, your math, your psychology, the fundamental courses. But then as you move into your major, you, there are some electives that you can take. So you have some options. Dep depending on what you're going to major in, you can sort of pick and choose what you want to study. But when it comes to God's word and spending time in his word, we, we can't afford to, to treat um, even Bible study and, and cell group as if they were some electives, as if they're not required courses. See, the problem is, is that when I think about the attendance and our participation in, in Sunday school and, and cell group, hallelujah, it's like that's not even important. You all are fine with just coming to church on Sunday morning. I'm okay because that's general education. Well, I'm here to tell you that's all you're going to get. 
is general education. But if you're going to move up and if you're going to graduate, hallelujah, and if you're going to grow higher and higher in the Lord, then you need to move on into the major leagues. You need to, when you enter encounter major situations, then you've got to come to cell group and Bible study and Sunday school so that you can learn the word of God. They're not electives, hallelujah. They're requirements. And I know you all are probably saying, Mikhail, look, now, um, you, know, I, you know, Sunday school is just not my thing. You know, I, I went to school, Sunday school when I was a little girl, and it was fine, but it's just, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with, you know, talking to people and sharing my faith in that way or listening. I'm okay with, you know, having Bible study on my own at home. Mm-hmm. And some of you might say, Wednesday night? Oh, my gosh. That, you know, how do I juggle work and how do I juggle um, the kids and feeding them? And I got projects and deadlines at work. And, you know, I know it's just an hour and a half, but I got 40 hours in the work week, and I just don't know. Okay, see, that math doesn't even sound right. It's just an hour and a half on a Wednesday night, and yet you got plenty of other hours in the week to get things done. But the problem is is that we're treating these things as electives. If you want to grow higher in God's grace and you want to grow higher in his word, then those things need to be requirements. I'm not a psychic. I know you, you know, as I was going through that, you may have thought that, oh, gee, she's psychic. She's reading my mind. No, I'm not psychic. It's just that I, I've said those, thing, those things myself. But I tell you, when you allow yourself to let go and say, you know what? Those are worldly things that God has already got it worked out. But if I stop and take time and I apply God's word and I I get with others and I learn his word with others, I will be so much more rewarded and, and enriched based on my interaction. The problem is, is that some of us, we treat our Bible study like homeschooling. You think you can just, you know, you don't have to interact with anybody else. You don't need to go to school with anybody else. You're fine with learning the word at home. But even in the public school system, homeschool, those who homeschool their children realize that they're sti- their children still need interaction. So they will schedule times where they, their children can go and participate in extracurricular activities so that they can engage with one another. Even when you are studying God's word, you cannot study in a vacuum, people. You've got to come and be a part of the body so that you can interact and and engage with one another so that you can understand, is the word that I'm, I'm studying on my own, how does it apply to my life? There's some things that I don't understand, but if I come to Sunday school and if I come to cell group, I promise you there'll be clarity and understanding in the word. Hallelujah. And then the other thing that Ezra teaches us is that not only do we need to read the word and study it, but we need to apply it. See, the text says that he obeyed the laws. He observed the laws. He kept the decrees. You've got to be willing to apply it. It's one thing to read it and sort of get a definition, but the next thing is how are you going to apply it? See, you know, plenty of us, we've got Bibles, we got the King James Version, we got the NIV, we've got the KJV, we got the ABC, we got everything, every kind of Bible. And we even have the Life Application Bible. But the question is, how are you applying the Word to your life? Some of us, you know, if we got a grade or if we were being evaluated, we will be considered magna cum laude when it comes to our devotional time. Yes, you've got your routine down and you read your word, absolutely. But would you flunk the test when it comes to how the word applies to your life and how active you have been doing it? Are you carrying it out or are you just hearing the word and not doing the word? Let's go to James. James chapter 1 right quick. James chapter 1, starting with verse 21. James 1 and 21. Or actually, uh, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. 
and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Have you ever looked in the mirror and if you saw a little dirt on your face, you would probably do whatever you could to get that dirt off. But it's amazing when we look in God's word and in this mirror, sometimes we see some dirt on our face and the word tells us how to get it off. We're not willing to do that. Mm -mm. Oh, no. Mm -mm. Uh -uh. But I tell you that the word is this real mirror and it will reflect the truth and it will teach you some things and it will even allow you to go a little deeper. So, see, sometimes the dirt that you see, that's just surface. Yeah. But when you spend quality time in the word and you go deeper in the word and because Hebrews 4 says that the word is alive and it's active and it cuts. And sometimes the word is going to cut and it's got to go deeper than the surface. When you look at this mirror, you've got to allow it to teach you some things about yourself and cleanse some spots that are not only just on the surface, but some dark spots that are in the inside that only the Holy Spirit knows about. But you've got to be willing to look in the mirror. And sometimes we look in the mirror and we walk away and we forget what we look like. You know, Caleb, bless his heart. I can tell him, and bless Kendall's heart too, because she's right in the same category. But we can tell them to clean up their rooms. And Caleb will go to his room, and I'll come back there in about 10, 15 minutes, check on him, see how he's doing. And he's doing this, playing with something. I said, Caleb, well, didn't I tell you to clean up your room? And he's looking around like, like what, what? I'm like, this mess here, you see it, I see it, it's still here. What, what happened? Oh, I forgot. You did not forget, boy, really? And that's what we do. We read the word. As children, God gives us instructions, and he tells us, you know, I need you to clean up your room. I need you to clean up your mess. I need you to clean up that relationship, that broken relationship with your sister or your brother in Christ. I, I, I'm giving you some instructions, and what do we do? We go to the room and start playing, doing everything else. Yeah. And say, oh, I forgot. You, like you all of a sudden got amnesia. <laughs> I don't think so. But you have other priorities. Even God says, I need you to spend more time in my word. And all of a sudden you get up in the morning, you get going and, oh, I forgot. Oh, you didn't forget, but you have other priorities. The word says that we need not look at it and forget what the mirror is showing us, but we've got to do and apply the word to our lives. As a student of the word, there's a note of caution. You need to be prepared for pop quizzes. See, when you study God's word, see, there's a purpose for school. You know, I send Caleb and Kendall to school because I expect that the teacher's going to teach them how to, you know, do math, reading, um, writing, all those fundamentals. There's a purpose for me sending them to school. And, and even if you can recall, when you went to school, there was a purpose for you going to school. And there were times when your teacher would tell you, you all need to read your textbook. You never know when I'm going to have a quiz. And all of a sudden, a, a pop quiz would come up. You're like, oh, man, I'm not ready. Really? And you would flunk the quiz. Well, guess what? Satan himself, he likes pop quizzes. Satan himself, he knows whether or not you've been reading his word. He knows when other things have taken over priority. He knows the trials and tribulations that you're going through. And pop, there goes a quiz. You get up in the morning and you go to work and you miss time and spending time with God. And pop, there goes a quiz as soon as you get to work. You get home and everything, you know, all hell is broken loose. And now pop, there goes a quiz. And the question is, are you ready for the quizzes? If you have not spent time in your word, then guess what? You're going to fail the quiz. And some of us wonder why we keep failing um, the trials and tribulations over and over again. Because you have not spent time in the word. And I used to hate those people who would come to class and didn't even open up a book. And they could, like, pass the test. At, at um, the, the um, Petaluma service, um, pet, um, pastor was there, and I said, Pastor, was that you? Are you, were you the type of person who didn't even have to read the book and you can come in and ace, ace the test? 
But in reality, Christians, we try to do the same thing. We think we can jump over these hurdles and, and face Satan and his obstacles without even opening up the book. Are you kidding yourselves? That may work when you were in ninth grade and in 10th grade, and it may have gotten by every once in a while in, in a, um, a college class, but in the study of life and in the, the school of life, you've got to read the word. You've got to be prepared. I tell you, the word will equip you but you've got to be willing to read it. As I was um, doing this study, I, I realized that not only was Ezra a student and he studied the word and he applied the word, but he taught the word. You see, you can't teach what you don't know. You can't be willing to evangelize what you don't and, and share the gospel with somebody if you don't know what the word says. See, that's why we need to take some time even to come to evangelism class. If you have not gone through pastor's evangelism class and you're going to try to share the word and save a brother or sister in Christ, you, I mean, to come to Christ, you can't do that if you have not spent time in the word. If we're going to teach, and pastor says that we're all priests, so it is all our responsibility to teach the word, but you've got to be willing to spend time in the word. It's interesting when you look at the origin of Ezra's name, his name means help. His name means help. And as I looked over this story, it was, it was interesting to see how Ezra lived up to his name, help. Because, why? Because he was willing to be devoted to studying God's word. He was willing to read and, and to apply the word. He was able to help the children of Israel. Ezra lived up to his name. Why? Because he understood the power of the word. I tell you that the word, the, God, the word of God is our help. If you need some instructions on how to live out your life, the word of God is your help. If you need some guidance on how not to exasperate your children, the word of God is your help. If you need some guidance on how to save your marriage, the word of God is your help. If you need some um, understanding of what is going on in the inside and you need healing and restoration, the word of God is your help. But you've got to be willing to open up the word of God. You've got to be willing with the same intensity that I had in reading the book called The Help. There, I should have been spending more time reading The Help itself, the word of God. You've got to ask yourself, what is my devotion like? What are the priorities that are competing and keeping me from reading the Word of God? You know, with the book, The Help, I mentioned that there were all sorts of great reviews that were written about the book. People, you know, talked about how riveting it was and how true to life it was. You know, if you took some time to read this word, you could write your own review. You could write your own book review. You could tell somebody just how good God has been to you. You could tell somebody, oh, I tell you, if you sit down and you read this book cover to cover, it will give you the clarity of who God is. If you are willing to read the book, you can write your own um, uh, evaluation or your own review of the book. It's interesting that I actually got two copies of the book called The Help. Sister Sheena gave me one, and then I got a copy for my birthday. And I thought to myself, as much as we give um, these books away, are we giving out this book? See, once you read this book and you begin to understand it, how are you giving this word? How are you sharing this word? That's what Ezra did. He shared the word of God with God's people. I want to before we go in prayer, just ask you, how would you evaluate your devotion right now? Have you been treating even coming to Sunday school and cell group as some obligation? Or have you been treating it as if, as if it was a duty that is required by all Christians? I want to begin to challenge you to approach those things, not as electives, but as an opportunity and as a requirement to renew your relationship and to go deeper in your word. 
If you are not in a cell group or in a Bible study, I want to encourage you today as we go into prayer, allow God to speak to you. Let us pray.